Hello, welcome to the Brazilian Health Nut Show. Here you will find cutting edge information provided by the best experts in the world so you can learn how to burn fat for the rest of your life. Bruno da Gama is the Brazilian Health Nut in a mission to solve the problems you have when trying to lose weight forever. He is a nutritional therapy practitioner, a certified personal trainer, and a holistic lifestyle coach by the Czech Institute. Don't forget to say hello and sign up to our free newsletter at www.brazilianhealthnet.com. Let's go! All right. Thank you so much for being here with me today, Brad. Super appreciate the time. Can you tell a little about your story, man? Now you're a health coach. Yeah, I'm a health coach. Um, I'm also a medical consultant, which uh, I've transferred that into helping businesses and private medical practices incorporate holistic uh, health strategies for their clients and sometimes for their business and their employees. Um, I think it's very important for that to happen, but I, I guess I'll tell you my story and I'll explain how that plays a factor in my story. Yeah. So growing up uh, you know, as a young guy, I was always very healthy, fit. I spent a lot of time in the wilderness. I was a wilderness guide. I, for many years, I took out uh, whitewater kayaking, canoeing, and rafting trips. I took out backcountry skiing trips, uh, which leads itself to uh, a healthy existence, very active. Um, moving by day, sleeping by night, which is a great way to stay healthy and stay in tune with the natural rhythms of the earth and circadian rhythms. Right. Um, as I got a little older, I met my wife-to-be. We married and had children. Um, and that's when the kind of necessity to be a provider as a father and a responsible adult, quote-unquote, um, came uh, pressure down on me. So I followed my passion for health and medicine into a career as a medical in medical devices. Now, ironically, um, the medical device aspect that I was working with was aesthetic medical devices. So that's anti-aging, working with plastic surgeons, dermatologists, training them, um, which was very different from working in the wilderness and teaching people about teamwork and survival and self-reliance. Um, but I was fascinated by the medical side. I was also fascinated by the technological side. And like I said, ironically, what happened is as I started to work in that environment, I gained some weight. I also started to look older. So while I was selling and helping doctors provide anti-aging um, treatments for their clients, I myself started to get older quicker, which mm -hmm. is kind of funny in a not funny way. Um, so by the time I had done that for a few years, I was look, people were guessing. When I started, people were thinking I was in my mid-20s when I was – a few years in, people were thinking I was in my early 40s, which yeah. was not really what you wanted to do or be in any field, but it was ironic that it was happening in the aesthetic anti-aging field. Um, mm -hmm. I took a long, hard look at myself, and I had some wake-up calls in my life. So there's a series of them. I can get into great detail, but I think that would take a very long time. So to explain it quickly... Um, the first thing that happened is I found out that I had Hashimoto's hypothyroiditis. Now, for those listeners who don't know about Hashimoto's, it's a, a thyroid autoimmune disease, which interferes with the production of uh, thyroid hormone and can, can play into factor in gaining weight, but it can also start to degrade your thyroid. So um, a lot of people... Uh, quickly go for the traditional method of treating this by going on medication. I asked my doctor, I said, you know, I have this Hashimoto's and I started to research it. Is there anything I can do to not go on medication? He said, well, you don't need to go on medication right now, but 
eventually you're going to have to go on medication. There's no thing, there's nothing you can do about it. There's nothing that you can do to stop it. And lifestyle has nothing to do with it. Well, I didn't buy that. I didn't like it. And I made a commitment to myself that I would make sure my metabolism and therefore my thyroid would remain um, active and vibrant and boosted um, no matter what. So I went on a mission to lose the weight that I had started to gain by working this corporate job and traveling and the pressure of all that corporate sales and consulting. Um, and I made a commitment to be in the best shape of my life within the next seven years. So I think that's an important thing for people to remember is health is not a short-term goal. It's a long-term good game. Right. And that means – you know, stepping forward and not to, to doing any of these fat or quick starvation diets, but moving gradually and progressively towards optimal health uh, so you yeah. can maintain that for decades to come. Yeah. yeah, there are so many things I want to get into about your story because I think it's fascinating. And the first thing is about when you had your first, first daughter and you went to the doctor and you were 50 pounds overweight and you were diagnosed with Hashimoto, right? So what did you decide that day? How, how was your mind working that day? Well, yeah, that's a great question. There was a few things that came to my mind. One was, you know, I'm a father. I need to be around for my daughter to provide for her, but also to love her and for her to have someone there, her, have her father there as she grows older, and not just as a child, as a teenager and as an adult. I, I wanted to be there for her wedding, I wanted to be there for whatever happens in her life. And I think it's really important for kids and I think even especially daughters to have a father. I wanted to be an active father. I didn't want to be limited by my physical limitations. So that was a factor. I also looked at myself in the mirror. And for a guy that was always active and fit, and I looked at myself in the mirror and I saw, you know, that those extra pounds. I saw that belly. I saw those sloped shoulders. I didn't see any definition that I used to have. I said, this is unacceptable. I have to make a decision right now. Am I over the hill at the young age of 30s, you know, in my early 30s, or, I'm gonna, or am I going to strive to be better than ever before? And I made a commitment to move forward. Um, mm -hmm. So that, does that decision just happen like automatically? Like how, I, I, I'm always fascinated about this because some people can have the attitude that you had and make this decision. And some people can look on, on the mirror and have the same image, but they keep going for years and years and never make the change. So how does that come? It's just about, okay, I am taking the decision to change my life. It's, a, it's you, right? You have to make the decision. Yeah. And I would say it was a combination of things being the, the, my age. So when you get to the age of around 30, um, I think a lot of people start reflecting on Are they getting too old? Are they getting close to over the hill? Where are they in their life? When you have a child, I think people reflect, what kind of father am I going to be? You know, am I going to step up as a, you know, people use that hashtag dad bod, which is <laughs> acceptable for people to have a, a belly and be out of shape as a dad because, yeah, being a parent is hard. It's, it's, uh, there's a lot of time that you lose where you could take care of yourself, but To me, that was unacceptable. I wanted to be a super parent, a super dad. And I looked at myself in the mirror and I thought about those things. Another factor was my uncle, who I was very close to, um, and still am close to, but he was in incredible shape when he was young. He used to run the 100 meter in just over 10 seconds, which was close to the world record when he used to do it. Super athlete. Um, he did the same thing. He had kids and he decided that he really needed to provide and he worked extremely hard. He didn't sleep well. He didn't eat well. He didn't manage his stress. Um, and basically, he had a stroke um, for various reasons. But that stroke really took him down. And I looked at myself and I said, if I continue doing this, I could end up like my uncle. I also felt mm -hmm. my ability, like when I climb up the stairs, it wasn't easy. Climbing up the stairs should be easy. It's not a hard and taxing thing. If it's not easy, changes need to happen. So... The combination of my uncle's stroke, being a father, my age, looking at myself in the mirror and knowing that I wanted to be not the guy I was looking at, but the guy I used to be, were all, was all enough to really motivate me to make these changes. 
Yeah. yeah, it's a combination of things, right? Yeah. And man, so you are in your forties now, and you said that you have more energy than you when you were on your thirties. How do you explain this to somebody who is listening to us and they don't feel good, right? Because I feel the same way. I'm on my late twenties, uh, and I feel that I have more energy than I, when I was, let's say, eighteen or twenty-one. No matter, because the things that I've been doing for the last five years, right? But it's hard to explain this to somebody who has never felt this way in their life. How do you start this conversation with somebody like that? Yeah, well, I think a lot of people are, they think they feel okay. And I think feeling okay is normal. Feeling okay is normal. Feeling great is normal. Waking up in the morning and feeling ready to go and tackle that day and passionate about your life and having that energy to to decide I'm going to not only am I going to climb the stairs, I'm going to choose to take the stairs instead of the elevator. I'm going yes. to run when I want to, you know, if, if forget about taking the bus or catching a cab, I'm going to walk because I enjoy it and it's good for me. Um, that kind of, that energy, it doesn't like, again, it doesn't happen all at once. Making those steps when you start eating well, when you start exercising, it's not going to be a monumental tra change right at, right at first. Um, but as it starts to take effect in your body, you're going to notice an increase of energy. First, you might actually feel worse because your body becomes more sensitive to the little changes. But then as you feel better, the food becomes energy. When you eat food, it shouldn't make you tired. When you mm -hmm. exercise appropriately, it shouldn't burn you out. So doing those things really went a long way to giving me energy and then perpetuating, motivating me to do it again and again and again. And the better I ate and the, the, the better I exercised and the better I managed my self-care from sleep to stress to meditation and all that other stuff, the more I felt I had a deeper reserve of real energy. And that's real energy, not like three cups of coffee or some five-hour energy drink, but real energy that comes from the proper nutrients and the proper movement and the proper air, proper breathing patterns to really elevate, you know, my state, my mind, body. Yeah. How long did it take it for, to get there? It was a, a journey, right? Because you're still learning what to do with your own body in terms of nutrition, physical activity, and all these subjects that you just mentioned. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and... I've always been a good researcher of information. Um, I've been fairly aware of exercise and, you know, I wasn't a bad eater growing up. I did fall into some bad patterns, but it's, it's never like a straight uh, upward climb. There's, there's dips, there's detours, there's setbacks. Um, and on my journey, you know, my first approach was kind of like a bodybuilding approach. And I took quite a bit of, well, actually, my first approach was to run. And I did a lot of cardio, almost mm. so much cardio I did that I lost a lot of weight, but I was losing muscle. Yeah, you burn now too, right? Probably after yeah. some time. Exactly. I wasn't feeling energized. I'd run. I'd feel like barely making it to 3 o'clock in the afternoon. I'd wake up at 5.30 in the morning and I'd run and then do a day of work. And by the time, you know, late afternoon came up, I was barely hanging on there. I'd be wanting to snack, my willpower would be down. Uh, so I learned that cardio in and of itself without other factors wasn't enough to really supply me with that energy. So that was my first lesson in kind of, you know, smart fitness. Yeah, working out smarter than just longer. Exactly. And then I moved into some weight training and I was never really into weights because I was a outdoor adventure athlete. I would, like I mentioned, I'd ski, I'd kayak, I'd rock climb, I'd scuba dive. So I would, it was more functional movement. So I got into weight training and I really enjoyed it, but I had to learn proper form, proper technique, proper sets and reps. Um, and then I got into the, the supplements of bodybuilding, right? And some of these supplements are packed with bad additives and um, preservatives and fillers and whatnot. And, uh, you know, there's weight gainers. So, you know, you think you want to build muscle. At one point I was taking a weight gainer without even knowing it. I thought it was just a protein shake. I gained about 15 pounds in a about a month and a half. 
Wow. And it wasn't all fat. It wasn't all muscle. There was a significant amount of fat that I gained. And I was looking bloated from, you know, poor, poor quality creatine and whatever else. So, I, again, a, a learning curve there. So I, I scaled back on the supplements. I really focused on what are good supplements. I changed my working out into not the the routines and the programs that you read about in a, you know, a muscle and fitness that a, a bodybuilding athlete who's on steroids and various other chemical drugs do because when you're on steroids, you can do a whole bunch of stuff and you're going to stay lean and you're going to build mass. And it's not a realistic program for people who aren't on steroids and steroids have a lot of drawbacks. So if anyone's thinking about jumping on steroids, I think a lot closer about it and know that you can get the body of your dreams and get the energy and keep your insides looking healthy without going on steroids. So yeah, yep. I changed my yeah, workout routines. I changed my supplements. Um, I got really into pure, clean nutrition. Uh, I delved deep into um, mind-body nutrition. I mean, I, I went through a course at uh, the Institute of Transformational Nutrition, which was a long, intensive course, which taught me about um, nutrition, psychology, um, spirituality, coaching, um, and it really kind of gave me a big broad picture on how to, you know, create health in all the ways, not just have a nice rip, ripped abs and a great body, but have a good body and also maintain energy and a good mind and a good, good internal workings on my organs and everything else, including my skin and everything else. Yeah. Yeah. It's hard to put into words this feeling. You, know, you guys got to go and experience it for yourselves. And Brad, there is you used to work on the aesthetic as well, right? On the with the medicine part. And I am from Brazil, and Brazil is the country that they do plastic surgery the most. Why do you think there is so many people that go for this quick fix, the external looking of their the body, right? What's your opinion about that? Well, yeah, that's a good question too. I think everyone wants to look or actually be younger. It's it's I find it's not maybe not everyone, but it is a prevailing attitude in our society um, and probably most of the world that we want to hold on to youth. It's an idea of being immortal. It's an idea of being um, young and vital for as long as you can. Now, mm -hmm. a lot of people approach it just from an external point of view. They just look at how can my skin be better? How can my body be better? You know, how can I have more shapely curves if you're a woman or how can I have, you know, men who put in calf implants or pectoral implants just so they can look fitter. Um, so it's a desired look, but the truth of the matter, and I mean, I was deep into this industry. I was sitting in operating rooms, helping plastic surgeons work their technology to get these results. I know the ins and out of the industry and I'll tell you, Most people I saw, even when they looked good on the outside, didn't feel great on the inside and were struggling to move, look, and feel young. Yeah, uh, there's, there's a big difference between the external and the internal because we only can see the external, but we don't know what's going on with the person, right? We're looking at them or even with others, like we see actress and all this, the business, right? Oh my God, they look so good. They're amazing. They must have an amazing life, but we don't really know what's going on when they go home, right? Exactly. And, you know, true youthfulness, true anti-aging happens in how you function. So it's not yeah. necessarily how you look. And I believe if you take care of your insides through nutrition, through uh, proper and appropriate exercise, through stress management, through healthy relationships, then your anti-aging um, is, you will look younger. You will look younger, your skin will radiate, you will have a brighter smile, you'll have more energy. And you know what, you're, you're much more likely to have longevity and live longer without disease than if you just work on you know, Botox, filler, Rest yeah, implants, yeah. um, resurfacing, all that kind of stuff.
Hey guys, what's up? Bruna Gama here, Brazilian Health Nut. And let's take a little break from the show because I would like to offer you something. If you go to my website, www.brazilianhealthnut.com and click on the page Burn Fat Forever, you can go ahead and claim your free consultation with me right now, okay? Or you can just send me an email at brazilianhealthnut at gmail.com. So you can start to lose weight and feel healthier right now, okay? So go ahead and claim your free consultation with me and remember that spots are limited, okay? Now let's get back to the show. Yeah, it's crazy. I was talking to my mom this week because she she did some bone broth to me here in Brazil because I love bone broth and it was hard to get some bones here. I don't know why, but we don't have the bones to make uh, bone broth. Anyway, so she did it and then after let's say, two days of me having the, the broth, I could feel on my skin. I would go to the, to the bathroom and look in the mirror and I could see my skin like so much more elastic and like shiny, just like from, from the collagen and from all the minerals and good fats into, in, the, in the bone broth. It's amazing. Like how can you see it's in two days? It's, it's, it's unbelievable the, how you can have more health from the inside out. Exactly. And I think, yeah. like you said something really good right there, good, good fats. I think for the last 20, 30 years, people have been anti-fat, you know, so with low fat diets, it's going to hurt every membrane in the body. It's going to hurt your skin. It's going to hurt your hormones. Um, fat is really, uh, and bone broth is an amazing anti-aging uh, internal medicine, if you want. Uh, but it's, it's something when people went low fat, they searched for anti-aging techniques in, in these treatments. And uh, funny enough that a lot of the treatments and even more so the skin creams and the uh, beauty products that people use are packed with toxins. They're packed with endocrine disruptors, which, which hurt your hormones. They are yeah, yeah. carcinogenic. They have proven links to cancer causing agents and um, when you're doing that your skin doesn't look good you know you're putting on your skin is your largest organ it absorbs everything you're putting into it you put on this stuff with chemicals and parabens and other stuff that companies are saying it'll make you 10 years younger whatnot and it actually is counterproductive you might have a smoother skin for a few days but you can't keep on using it it impacts your skin and impacts your health Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, that's so, so true. true. And man, uh, I remember when I was doing some research to talk to you today, through your journey, you went to a conference and you listened to two guys talking there. I would like to talk about the first one, which was, I think, a medical doctor. And he was talking about the profits from the from medicine and that the, the goal of the medicine is to make a profit. And how do you feel when you heard that? Well, yeah, that's a, that's a, it was a pretty uh, eye-opening moment in my life. Not that I didn't fully know it, but I was right there. So I had been hired for a large corporate position at a very large multinational multi, um, corporation, which I'm sure all you listeners would know, but I'm not going to bring it up by name. Yep. Um, and they flew me down to this big meeting, and the, it was actually their vice president of healthcare for the world. He had flown it flown in to speak about this and he brought up the fact that and this is we were talking about medical devices here and diagnostic medical devices. So devices that are going to tell people whether they have cancer or what's wrong with them, ultrasound machines, MRIs, CAT scans, all those kind of machines. And he got up in front of this room of I think there was about fifteen hundred employees there. Big, big room. And he said, we're going to take a page out of pharma's book. So pharma, this pharmaceutical company's books. We are no longer going to bring to market machines that don't give us a profit. It doesn't matter if they work. It doesn't matter if they solve the problem. What big pharma does is when they create a pill and it doesn't, and it, and it doesn't look like it's going to be profitable, it doesn't matter if it will cure or fix a disease they don't bring it to market and he said we're gonna do the same thing here so if we create a machine that is great at what it does but it's not profitable then we're not bringing it to market and I was like 
how can I be part of this? This is not what healthcare is about. This healthcare industry has its priorities flipped upside down. It's crazy. Yeah, yeah it's, that's a huge subject. We could just talk about this the whole show. So, yeah, let's talk about something even better. Because you listened to a guest and he was talking about happiness. He was, uh, his name was Sean, and I actually read his book. I forgot his last name right now, but he was talking about the happiness advantage. So you look at what he was talking, and then you felt something completely different, and you took a different path on your journey, right? Yeah, exactly. So Sean Acker is his name. He wrote The Happiness of right, right. excellent book. He was a Harvard-trained psychologist that really embraced positive psychology. He talks worldwide now. I had read his book. And it was very ironic that when I showed up at this conference for medical professionals, for medical device professionals and salespeople and everyone at this company, that they had invited him to speak. And he was talking about basically workplace happiness. Um, but <laughs> again, it was ironic because he spoke to me in the fact that he, he talked about how happiness should come first and so often what we do is we work towards happiness by trying to make more money or get a new title a promotion a vice presidency a presidency you know manager of that manager of this and we have these landmark goals that when we reach them we think we're going to be happy and yes. he flips it on his head he says first be happy choose to be happy and he gives lots of concrete ways on how to be happy and then these goals become easier and they're not even as necessary and yeah. to me yeah. i realized that that was what it's all about i mean i need to be happy i need to be happy to be a good father to be a good husband to be ha to be satisfied and vibrant in my health in my life so this job was not the right job for me uh, it was a well-paying you know, nice title, very respectful, but I, I resigned from the position and I focused on how can I make positive changes in the world? How can I be happy first? How can I make others happy and realize that happiness is more important than titles and money? And it was, it was, uh, it was ironic that at this new position, this guy had talked to me and told me that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it changed your life completely. Yeah, let's be happy first, guys. It's uh, I try to live by that so I can achieve whatever I want, but being happy before. Uh, you don't need those things to be happy. Uh, Brad, I would love to do an exercise here that I haven't done with anybody, and I think you're the perfect guest here to do it. So let's pretend that I am your client, okay? So let's say I am 15 pounds overweight, I am a mom or I'm a father, very busy person who comes to you and say, Brad, please me help me, I want to be healthier, I want to lose some weight. How do you start this conversation? What's your pro protocol to help people to lose weight? Yeah, well, first of all, my, over, my overall arching, overreaching protocol is to really empower people to take help into their own hands. So I think the saying, you know, teach a man, give a man a fish and they eat for a day, teach a man to fish and they eat for life, really plays a big role in what I do. So I want to empower people. So to, to get them empowered is a lot about education. But what else I need to know is what is your big why? So what is it? Why do you want to be healthy? And we really need to drill down into this aspect to find out what really is your underlying motivator. Because like I said, with my story and with pretty much anyone else's story and life in general, you're going to have points of frustration, of failure. Um, you're going to run into obstacles. You're going to be unmotivated. So you need to find something that pushes you through those walls. So, so are you talking to them like a live or through Skype? And how does that work? Like are you just finding their wife first on the first consultation? Is that how it is? Yeah. So it depends on where they're coming from, what level they're at. But essentially, one, I have different tools and strategies to do this. I mean, we could, I could ask them if they know. And if I feel like they're really being honest with themselves that can be a good start. I would ask them to write it down. I would also ask them 
you know, I would ask them a bit about what they are doing now, what they've tried in the past. Um, and then I would say, you know, what are you doing now? And a lot of people will say, well, you know, I eat out a lot. Uh, fast food happens because I work hard. I don't have time. I would ask, okay, or maybe they smoke or maybe mm -hmm. they, you know, don't exercise. I ask you, okay, how old are you? I'd ask. I'd say, imagine 10 years from now, continue doing what you're doing like you are today for the next 10 years. I want you to now write down where you think you will be in 10 years if nothing changes. Mm, yeah. So, not good. <laughs> yeah. So, if they do that, a lot of times they can actually take the time to reflect properly because most people don't like to really think about these things. They kind of mm -hmm. ignore it until it's a, some a health crisis creeps up. So if they write down, if they are smoking and eating fast food, not exercising, they're 15 pounds overweight, and they continue to do this, and they're 40 years old or 35 years old, by the time they're 45 or 50, they know that they're going to be even more overweight. They know mm -hmm. that they're going to probably have high blood pressure. Maybe they're going to have you know, type 2 diabetes or be pre-diabetic. They know they're going to have less energy. Um, they probably know that they're going to have, you know, look less vibrant. So they're not going to be as youthful in their appearance or movement. So they take the time to write all this down. And I'll, I'll push them a bit to actually explore this in great detail. So they can reflect mm -hmm. on how serious this can be. And I find they need to do that. Yeah. yeah. So you, well, you want to find your why first. You you actually are doing psychology before anything, before nutrition, before physical activity, and I I love that. That's the approach I also take with clients. I, I love it. So what's the second step? Let's say after you finding your why, you really get your mind right, and you okay, I'm ready. I'm gonna do whatever I have to do to take my health on my own hands and take it back, right? So what's the second step? So the second step. You know, a lot of people, there's access to a lot of good information out there. You can get a lot of good information on eating well and uh, exercising well. Uh, like you said, psychology is paramount um, and finding that why. But moving forward from psychology is taking small steps that are sustainable and that make an impact and being patient with yourself. And knowing that it's not going to happen all at once. And it didn't, you didn't get out of shape all at once. So to get back in shape, we're going to take small steps. So I would say I like to look at things from a tapering program first. So when I say tapering, I approach things as what are you doing now that isn't good? So you're going to McDonald's. Do you think McDonald's is good? Well, no, it's not really very good. I'm not going to say give up McDonald's, even though I think you should. I'm going to say if you're going to McDonald's three times a week, I want you to go two times a week. And after a couple of weeks, I want you to go once a week. Mm -hmm. So you're giving them the choice, actually, not saying don't do this, don't do that. But you're saying, I think this would be better, but you still have the choice. And I think that's super important for people to feel that they have control also, right? Exactly. And one tool at a time. So reducing fast food increasing water intake you're not drinking any water during the day well i'd like you to drink one glass when you wake up I'm not asking them to drink eight glasses you know you don't like salad okay please eat a little bit of vegetables one cup of vegetables add that to your day and we can move up from that you know you're you're eating fried food i'd like you to slowly cut that back and transfer the oils that you're using to a healthier oil, you know, and some people aren't, I mean, like I, I did say that people are aware of a lot of information, but a lot of people aren't aware of things like the detrimental effects of vegetable oil, hydrogen. Yeah, there is a lot of misinformation as well. There is contradictories uh, everywhere that you look, especially nowadays with the internet, you can just Google, let's say, if you do a, a Google for pretty much anything, you can find both sides. You can find egg is horrible, it's going to kill you, and egg is the healthiest food in the world. Exactly. Um, yeah. And, you know, some of these things hold on harder than others, partly, because I believe, because there's the commercial interests involved in them, lobbying groups. So you have wheat boards or dairy boards or 
you know, even registered dietitian associations that have been sponsored by companies like Coca-Cola who hold on to these other ideas about what is healthy because, first of all, that's all they've been taught. They've been giving out that information for a long time and they, they would feel, you know, like hypocrites to change now. So mm -hmm. it's an ego mm -hmm. thing. They hold on to that information. Secondly, they still believe that either low fat is good or that vegetable oil must be good or, you know, uh, that these things aren't as bad as they should be because they're allowed to happen by governments. So re-educating and, you know, I do have a degree in education as well on top of what the other certifications I have. So I think education is a big part of it and educating in a way that it's easily absorbed mm -hmm. is very important. Yeah, so, so it's most steps in education. That's the second step. And how long does it take usually that you see if your clients through, so they really get this the, the information and they can apply in their life because that's the most important thing, right? Not just to have in their head, but also having into their life, applying, put it into action. Yeah, so this is really individualized. And a big part of what I believe is in individualized care. Uh, while I think there are some things that are good for everyone, vegetables are pretty much good for everyone. Um, mm -hmm. having more quality fats are pretty much good for everyone. I think it's important for me to treat every case as an individual. There are some people, I mean, we can get into a lot of technical stuff here, but there are some people and women more so than men that do very poorly on, on, you know, strategies like intermittent fasting for some people, myself included, intermittent fasting can be an amazing tool and I, I can, It, it can make me feel good. It can help my mental, uh, you know, my mental acuity. It can drop weight, energy. It can even help me build uh, lean muscle mass. But I've seen other people where it's just, it stresses their adrenals out um, and they get it run down. So uh, approaching each individual and then monitoring them. So to say how long does it take till they actually see changes will depend a big part on their psychology, so how motivated they are by their why. Is their why truly their deep why? It'll depend on how quick they can taper, um, how poor their habits were, um, what their current environment influences are, environmental influences of their use, you know, they're a business guy. Like I was, I was in corporate sales. You're surrounded by people, you're always doing these lunches, business lunches, You have to consciously and proactively get ahead of it. Everyone's going yes. out for these, you know, these big burgers and cheeseburgers and whatnot. I either had to eat ahead of time and join them for lunch and just have a salad to talk at the table, or I would consciously look at the menu and say, how can I reduce my chances of a poor choice here? So one of the strategies I use personally and I advise people to use, when you're out and you're forced to eat out, or you're choosing to eat out, I lean towards things like fish or vegetarian meals rather than poor quality meat or chicken um, because of the hormones and antibiotics and the poor quality in them. And I would lean toward away from some of the salad dressing. So, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes my staple choice going out for lunch or for a business meeting was like a salmon and a salad. Yeah, so you're, you're ahead of the game. Preparation is key. I think also not just like on this situation and when going to eat out, but also for cooking at home. I personally, I take one of my days, let's say an afternoon, like a Sunday afternoon, just to go ahead and cook, pretty much have everything set up for the following days. Right. So I think cooking and being ahead of the game is super important on the world that we live nowadays because we are busy, everyone is busy, and then when you see you are in a situation when we have no more control. Uh, is there anything else in terms of your pro protocol to lose weight and to be healthy that you would like to share? Well, I work with a lot of parents, being a parent myself, understanding it from their perspective, um, and parents are just like everyone else except they have the added stress and time constraints of having kids, having getting to kids to school, juggling that kind of stuff, you know, probably getting less sleep, woken up early, less flexibility. So like you're saying, meal prep is huge. And I think having a single meal, like a dinner together as a family can be one of the most important things for health, both in 
weight loss, but also psychologically for a family. And there's plenty of studies that show that kids that have regular dinners with their parents grow up with less issues surrounding drug abuse, gangs, violence, they have better self-esteem, they're more likely to talk about things at the table, they're more likely to maintain healthy eating habits. So I have a daughter that has a lot of uh, severe food allergies. My wife's story is pretty amazing as well because she has uh, rheumatoid arthritis and she's mm-hmm. able to manage rheumatoid arthritis as well as I manage Hashimoto's hypothyroiditis, two autoimmune diseases without any medication. And we do that through home cooking and proper nutrition. So like you said, plan ahead. I have strategies on my website. I have blog posts. We have a a meal plan. Um, There's recipes that all um, gear towards creating a single fairly simple meal for families to eat that are healthy, nutritious, and delicious, and easy to prepare. And I think that is a huge, a huge advantage that people can take. Yeah, awesome, awesome. Awesome stuff, man. And before we go, I know we don't have much time left here, but I would lo- love to you to share a little bit about this thing that you have created. It's, a, it's actually called Create Your Day. And so it's about how to start your day on a good position and so you can have a productive and healthy day, right? Can you share just a little bit about how do you start your own day? Sure. So the Create Your Day method um, is something I put together and it's really a, a synthesis of a lot of techniques that really help to start the day in the right way. And when you start the day in the right way, you kind of win your day before it even starts. As a busy parent or as a busy person, Um, Getting up a little earlier might seem crazy. You might need more sleep. But when you get into a routine and you implement the create your day method, it really is a needle mover for your energy levels and a big part for your attitude and outlook on life, which goes to more success at work, better motivation, greater willpower. So the create your day method is an acronym. The word create is the acronym. Mm C-R-E-A-T-E. The, fir- the C is for calm, and calm stands. Calm is representative of meditation. Now, well, you know, some people think meditation is woo-woo stuff that you have to be a monk or some sort of, you know, hippie to do it. But meditation has incredible proven clinical benefits through lots of medical research, um, physiological, psychological. Um, there's even stuff coming out now that helps with anti-aging. Um, so I encourage everyone to do some form of meditation. Um, <laughs> one of the best, easiest implementable meditations is transcendental meditation. Um, the course that you take is a little costly, but it's well worth it. But for those listeners who aren't going to do that, I'd say a simple way to get started with medica- meditation is not to hold yourself to these unrealistic levels um, and expectations, you sit down comfortably and you give yourself even five minutes. But, you know, if you can strive to get 20 minutes done, that's great. You're going to... Yeah, it starts with five days. Five, sorry, five uh, minutes. It's super important. Yeah. I think to shrink it down. And if they have more time, then they can do a little more. But yeah, five, five minutes is good. Make it, make it attainable. Make it manageable. And have little successes that you can build upon that. And that's what I like to approach everything with. So just by breathing in and breathing out and, you know, you can use a mantra. Um, uh, a mantra can be anything like calm in, calm in. And as you repeat the word calm in, calm in in your head, you allow yourself to breathe and calm down. And that's just a time, even if you're not getting anywhere, it's a time that you're slowing that pace of life down, which doesn't happen that much these days for a lot of people. It's really important for stress. Like I said, for physiological and psychological reasons, um, when thoughts come in your mind, it's okay. Don't beat yourself up about it. Mm-hmm. Gently push yeah. them out and go back to the mantra. Start. What with about the letter R? The what letter does it stand R, for? The next letter R is rehydrate. So, um, for those who haven't heard it, but it's really important to wake up in the morning and uh, after you're doing meditation or even before, have a glass of water. Now, that should be clean water. 
uh, you know, filtered water or mineral water. And uh, I like to add uh, half a lemon squeezed into that. It helps detoxify the body. It helps get the, the organs going. Um, and for those of you who are into, you know, weightlifting or exercise, it actually it dehydration impairs strength. Dehydration impairs mental function. So rehydrating with a glass of water with a little lemon is a great way to get you rehydrated, alkalize the body, and get you going. Yeah. I don't know if... Do you know Anne Louise Gitleman? She's the, like the first lady of nutrition. Yes. I don't know if you... Yeah. So I, I was talking to her last week and I asked, what's your best advice? And I was like, just give us one action step for people to do it. And she's like, oh, go have your water with lemon. So that was her best tip for us. So that's great. Yeah, exactly. It's easy. So what's next? To be able to do it. The next yeah. is E. And uh, the E is for envision. And envision is, um, I look at this as a way to kind of set your mind on the day ahead. So uh, there's three goals for the day ahead. Um, they can be small, but there's something that you can complete in that day. Um, so write down three goals on how you want the day to progress, what you want to do. But you don't have to say like make a million dollars or you know bench press 400 pounds, but <laughs> something attainable that you will have success with. And when you build upon these day in, day out, especially if you write them down, if you keep a journal over the course of a year, it's pretty amazing to look back on what you've accomplished. And it is very motivating and it helps you stick forward with all your you know, your goals or your New Year's resolutions or whatever else. Yeah, that's so important. I love journaling. I do every morning too. So next one starts with A, which is? The next one's A, so we're at the A on create, and that's for attitude. Attitude is sometimes the only thing that you can control. So we focus on attitude. The best way to create a good attitude is to be grateful. Yeah. Um, how do you be grateful? Well, a lot of people are always looking up at people who have more than them. It's important to appreciate what you have. I mean, I just read a quote. I've heard it a bunch of times, but happiness is l liking what you have already. Okay, yeah. So it's writing down three things that you're grateful for. And that could be things, you know, I write down often. I'm grateful for my healthy children or I'm grateful for, you know, the opportunity to share, you know, my, to share my strategies, my knowledge, and help other people. I'm grateful for to live in a time where I have access to, you know, clean water and food and I can survive without a saber-toothed tiger chasing me. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. I do the same thing. I actually also uh, say three things that I'm grateful for. for. <laughs> It's funny. We are on the same page here. So, like, second last one is... It starts with T on create. So the second last one on the, is the T, and that's for tunes, and tunes is music. Um, and I think this is mm. underappreciated. And the more, I, I mean, I recently in the last year, I moved from Toronto, which is the largest city in Canada, uh, to Victoria. And while I'm talking about tunes here, I'm going to take a little aside and say, sounds in general play a big part in how you feel. And people don't always realize that. So if you're near construction, for an extended period of time, it can throw you off. If you hear, you know, babies crying or squeaking or sirens, it can throw you off. But when you hear nice sounds, whether that be natural sounds like waterfalls or streams or, you know, a good a bird song um, or music, so take control of sound. And that's what I was getting to is put on some music that makes you feel good, alive, that uplifts you, that... Uh, you know, that touches your spirit. Music yeah, that's an amazing tip. I actually use music throughout my day, especially when I'm on, the, on a low stage where I need some more energy and I go ahead and, oh, I need some music. But I never did in the morning, so I'm going to experiment with this tip. And so last one now, it's E on create, which is? So the last one, E on create, is energize. And while you can do this in various ways, I think movement is a very important part of health. And without getting into exercise, so this is beyond exercise, I use the sunrise salutation, uh, you know, the yoga pose uh, series that really opens up the body. It opens up some of the meridian. It stretches. It gets blood flow going. Um, if you're unfamiliar with the sunrise salutation, you can find it online. You can also go to my website 
and find the create your day method there, um, which is a free resource and essentially it helps you breathe right. So breath work is very important. It helps stretch out the body, the muscles, blood flow, oxygen. Um, that's just a great way to start the day by activating the body. Cool. Cool, man. A lot of nice information here. Love it, love it, love it. So where can people find you and what's next for you now? So you can find me. My website's uh, bradrudner.com. Um, that's Rudner, R-U-D-N as in now, E-R. And okay. what's next for me? Well, I'm working on a couple books. Um, one short book talking about what I mentioned to you about the, uh, the kind of the dark side of the beauty industry because I know it intimately. So, uh, you know, talking about my experience with that. Um, I'm also working on a book about nature. So nature is a very important part of life to me and a health. Um, I moved uh, across the country to be in a more natural environment with my kids and my family. Um, and I really want to impress upon people that if you're struggling with weight, with health issues, um, with stress, nature can reset all that. I used to guide lots of wilderness trips. So, uh, you know, a few nights, I'm not telling you, I know, I know not everyone can get out and go camping, but time out in nature can really reset your circadian rhythm and uh, ground you and put you back in a state of balance. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm working on a book like that. I've got a few programs that will be coming out um, about, you know, re uh, opening up the body for quicker fat loss by cleaning up the body. Um, and, uh, yeah, I do a lot of writing uh, for my own, my own blog as well as for some other, other people's blogs. Uh, my wife's now involved in the business, and she is uh, doing functional diagnostic nutrition, which enables us to do testing for people, so we can get lab tests and help them with adrenal fatigue. And uh, beyond that, there's always other projects that I'm working on. Um, but uh, yeah, I think that's probably enough for. <laughs> that's a lot of things. Congratulations, man! And man, thank you so much for being here. That was a I love the show. A lot of good information, and I hope to talk to you soon. Yeah, well, thank you, Bruno, and it's uh, great to be on the show. It's an honor, and I uh, hope people got a lot out of it, and they can, you know, improve their health and burn fat forever. Thanks for listening to the Brazilian Health Nut Show. Go to www.brazilianhealthnut.com for much more information about how to burn fat for the rest of your life. Hasta luego.